Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's 60-minute presentation as part of the webinar series of Wednesday Rainmaking by the Women Rainmakers of the American Bar Association Law Practice Division. This webinar is being recorded. My name is Lauren Krauss, and I am the Senior Meeting Planner with the Law Practice Division of the ABA. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation, and the PowerPoint slides will be emailed to you after the presentation. Please enter your questions into the question box in the webinar panel on the right side of your screen as you think of them so we may prioritize the group questions as we anticipate over 100 callers. Please assist our Women Rainmakers Committee by taking the time to complete the evaluation which is at the end of the program. This assists us in developing future programs. We really welcome your input. Our moderator today is Carol M. Bass who is a committee member of the Women Rainmakers Committee. Carol joins us today from New York City where she is a partner in the Trust and Estates and Family and Matrimonial Law Practice Groups at Moses and Singer LLP. Carol's practice focuses on estate planning, estate administration, estate and trust related litigation, and pre and post nuptial agreements. In addition to her involvement with the Women Rainmakers Committee, Carol is an active member of the ABA Real Property Trust and Estates Law Section and serves on its CLE Standing Committee as a co-chair of its Non-Tax Issues Committee. Thank you, Lauren. And we thank all the rainmakers around the country who have chosen to learn more about building their practices through blogging and podcasting. The mission of the ABA Women Rainmakers is to educate professional women about marketing and business development, to provide mentoring opportunities for members, and to provide networking opportunities to build personal and professional relationships. You can find up-to-date information on our activities on our homepage or by Googling ABA Women Rainmakers Law Practice Division. We are pleased to offer a limited time discount to listeners of this webinar to purchase the book, Marketing Success, How Did She Do That?, which features interviews with 46 successful women rainmakers, including some who blog, so it's a good companion resource to today's webinar. The book is available for purchase at shopaba.org. When you check out, you can input the code MS621, which is on this slide, to receive 10% off. This is a limited time offer, valid only until September 21st, 2017. We are thrilled to have two wonderful panelists for today's webinar, Lindsay A. Zahn and Nicole Aboud. Lindsay A. Zahn is an alcohol, beverage, and food attorney at Lehrman Beverage Law, PLLC. Lindsay has counseled wine, beer, and spirits companies on licensing and compliance, federal and state labeling, customs regulations, supplier agreements, and advertising and promotions. She is an award-winning author on wine law, publishes a leading wine law blog called On Reserve, and has traveled to over a dozen wine regions in the U.S. and Europe. Additionally, she has given talks and instructed classes on wine law throughout the country and in France. In 2014 and 2015, her blog was nominated as one of the top 100 legal blogs by the ABA Journal. Lindsay, thank you for joining us today. We are excited to learn more about building a practice using legal blogging. Thank you so much, Carol, and thank you all for joining us. I'm really excited to be here today and to tell you a bit more about my practice, my blog, and some of the tips and tricks that I've learned in the last several years um, as a blogger, as a lawyer, and as a practitioner in a very small niche practice. Um, I'd like to start my presentation out today with an introduction and a story about uh, my experiences, who I am, and what exactly it is that I do. And then I'm going to get more into um, why lawyers should blog, um, why you should consider starting a blog if you haven't already. And then I'm going to talk about tips on starting a legal blog. Um, since we all, I'm sure, know there are some very specific things we should consider, especially when publishing a legal blog, um, as well as some tips on maintaining the legal blog and some resources that I find very helpful um, to me when I work on my blog. Um, so just to give you a general introduction about myself, um, as Carol mentioned, I am an alcohol beverage lawyer. I work at a um, small law firm. It, there are about seven lawyers or so. We focus exclusively on alcohol, beverage law, and food law. I would say probably about 80, 85 percent of our practice is um, alcohol, beverage law. And that covers everything from 
regulatory compliance to contracts to trademark to business corporate issues that come up um, in the wine and beer spirits industry as well as just general licensing uh, permitting and such that our clients uh, whether they be wineries, breweries, distilleries, importers, distributors, retailers, face um, on an ongoing daily basis. Um, I really got into this area because I am a strong, I have a very strong interest and love for food and wine as well as culture and travel. And I think that that being able to combine all of those elements into my daily practice as a lawyer is truly what fostered this passion and this interest in this area of law. Um, I have a degree in hotel administration from Cornell, and I initially thought I would end up becoming a hospitality lawyer, working on a lot of employment law cases, but uh, towards the end of my time at Cornell, I, um, I was given an article to read by one of my professors in a restaurant management class that detailed a scandal that broke out in the Brunel de Montalcino region in roughly 2008, where some producers there were using grapes other than what was allowable under Italian law, um, and bottling it as Brunel de Montalcino, which is pretty high-end wine, if you're familiar with wine. Um, and there were a lot of attorneys that were involved in that case that were both prosecuting and defending those wineries, and um, they specifically focused on wine law, and that to me was just something that kind of grasped me just as an interest. It, it wasn't necessarily something I knew from the start I would definitely go into. It was just something I knew I wanted to explore more. And um, you know, as I've really been able to do so in the last few years that I've been practicing, the last five years I've been practicing, I've really been given a lot of opportunities that I sincerely believe have emerged from the start of my blog. And my blog is called On Reserve, a wine law blog. Um, it, I've been writing it for about seven years starting next month, which is pretty remarkable for me at least, um, just knowing that I've kept up with something that long. And I honestly believe it's been a factor for a number of different opportunities that I've had in my career so far. Um, just to give you some idea, um, I started it in June or July of 2010 um, when I was in law school. I did the research to start it in June when I was trying to research different portals, what I should use to start a blog, um, what I should be considering, and then I actually published my first article in July 2010. I did it because I was in the process of working on a uh, law journal note that I was researching and spending a lot of time on. Um, I was working on an intellectual property issue dealing with wine and I was learning so much about wine law, how it was regulated, how wine's regulated, international issues, that I thought it would be a really great way to showcase what I was researching and um, what I was learning, as well as to write about something I was sincerely interested in, but wasn't necessarily being exposed to on a daily basis in law school. When I started the blog, there weren't that many other alcohol beverage law blogs out there. There may have been one or two, but they weren't regularly updated. I never really expected anyone to read it, but to be quite honest, since July of 2010, I've had a significant amount of traffic, readership, um, just potential people uh, reaching out to me, whether it be about projects or just general questions that are really intrigued about what I do. Um, but when I started it in 2010, there really weren't many lawyers on social media. It was pretty rare. Uh, seeing someone on Twitter or Facebook or even having a blog, it, it just wasn't really something that, that was around then. It's a bit different now. Of course, you certainly see it much more frequently. Um, but there were, of course, even fewer people out there talking about alcohol beverage law specifically. And again, you know, I really saw it as a means to develop a network when I was in law school to learn more about an area that I was interested in. And all this being said, I again, I never really anticipated it would be something I would definitely end up practicing. It was just really by virtue, I think, of a lot of fate um, that just really kind of worked out for me. Uh, so as I blogged and wrote and networked, it, my blog became a leading industry resource. It was picked up and republished by a lot of wine industry publications that send around feeds that have their own readership. Um, and a lot of my traffic was generated, a lot of my readership was generated from that. So I really got a lot of people interested just by way of being considered um, a good resource, someone that, that had 
some things to say about issues that were really pertinent to the industry at the time. And sincerely, as I, as I mentioned previously, the response really exceeded my expectations. I wouldn't be here seven years later still talking about this if I didn't think it was worth my time and my effort, um, particularly as you know someone that has been, has been working and, and is five years into her career and um, you know has a lot of things to deal with on, on a daily basis. You know, I, I wouldn't take the time, non-billable time, where I, I spend and update my blog and, and make sure things look professional. Um, but it really has sincerely been worth my uh, my time and my energy. I've been able to meet a lot of professionals in the industry, as well as law students who are interested in the field, other lawyers. It's been a really good resource for potential referrals to my firm, to my practice, um, and as well as other opportunities. Uh, speaking and writing and publishing and what have you. So today, as I mentioned, it's a really good resource for potential clients. Um, I've gotten several clients, whether it be locally or internationally, from my blog, um, or even just people who are generally interested in working with me, um, whether or not it may go through is a different story. I've been granted a lot of opportunities to write and to speak. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more later, um, and it's also just served as a means to validate my interest and experience in the industry. I think one of the first things that um, I, um, that, that people do when they consider hiring an attorney or when they consider even hiring maybe you, they look you up online and they want to see you know, what kind of experience you really have in, in the industry. And having something like a blog or you know, really good following serves as an excellent means to show that you're serious. It shows that you know what you're talking about, you're knowledgeable, and it's also just extremely helpful for, for people in the industry. Um, so because I was blogging so often several years ago, I was actually offered both an internship and a job um, with my current firm by people who read my blog that just happened to stumble upon my blog. I think that that's, I mean, again, I never anticipated going into such a niche area, but it really was just you know, very welcoming at the time, and it was a really great opportunity. Um, on top of that, I have been allowed, I've been invited to speak at various CLEs. I've written lots of articles, um, participate in webinars, and I very recently contributed, contributed a book chapter on uh, wine and beer law, which was really exciting and um, a really unique opportunity for me. It's also a really great opportunity for writers who are working with um, publications like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, et cetera, um, to come and to look for someone who can comment on um, a really hot topic that can provide legal insight or just um, expertise and be able to talk more about something that they might be working on. Um, I've also been asked to teach a course in Champagne, France. I'll be heading um, in the fall to Champagne to teach a little bit more on wine trademark laws in the United States. Um, so that's also been a really incredible opportunity. And on top of that, you know, as I mentioned, lots of inquiries from potential clients and um, also the opportunity to appear on American Bar Association Journal's uh, uh, Top 100 Legal Blogs, which is a really great resource for anyone that may be looking for potential blogs to read in the legal industry. So um, one of the questions that you may be asking right now as you're sitting through this podcast is, why should you start a blog? Well, you certainly increased exposure as, as we've talked about already, um, but one thing to really think about is before you hire someone, whether it be a lawyer or maybe someone to come work on your house, a plumber, et cetera, I mean, don't you look them up online? Don't you look their company up online? Don't you read reviews? I mean, maybe it's not truly the same thing for lawyers because I, the reviews portion hasn't caught on so much, but if you see someone who contributes a lot online and, and has a significant amount of exposure, I think it tends to create a certain type of impression to a potential client that you're pretty serious and dedicated to what you do and, and that you certainly are knowledgeable. It's also a really good opportunity to tap into new markets. Maybe you're sitting here thinking about blogging on a new area of law or something you're not very familiar with, or you want to use it as a learning opportunity or, or a way to maybe even expand your firm's practice. I think it's a really great resource there um, to be able to write, a, write on it and write about a topic and drive traffic to your firm's website or to the blog um, and, and get some potential 
uh, clients there as well. And the other thing to consider is there may be competitive firms that already have blogs. Um, you might be you might see that your firms within your practice group that are blogging, and it's quite possible that because of how Google and other search engines rank, you know, if a potential client might be looking up a specific legal question or a legal topic, their website might come up before your firm's website because they have a blog or they have something that's on point. Um, so I think that that's another reason to really consider starting a blog and talking more about your practice. Um, on top of that, you know, we're really getting into an age where consumers want to feel connected to a product or to a company that they're associated with. It's a lot about sharing. It's a lot about knowing more about the product or the company and, and really understanding their values. I think that a blog is a really good way to voice your opinions and to be vocal about industry concerns. Um, another thing to consider is that in 2017, many lawyers can be found on social media or they have a blog. Um, I think it's very rare that you look someone up on Google or online and you see that they don't have some sort of um, internet footprint. And I think that this is even more true in 2017 than it was in 2010. And it certainly will be even more true going forward as um, the law practice changes more and more and becomes a bit more virtual. Uh, so, and then one final consideration is that certainly the law firm website might not drive in as much relevant traffic if you're posting blog articles about very specific topics, very specific um, problems, issues that your clients ask or deal with on a daily basis. It's going to drive in a lot more relevant traffic. Um, I would use it as an opportunity if you have any strange questions that come in, you might be able to talk more about it, specifically if it's something you see that other clients may be facing. Um, and in my opinion, it's, it's worked better than Google Ads, just being able to speak about some of these things and, and drive in possible traffic as opposed to buying ads on Google and, and hoping that someone relevant will come through. So here are some tips on starting a legal blog. Um, so I think when you decide you want to blog, you need to think about a topic. And that's, of course, probably the most important part about legal blogging at this point for you. Um, maybe the internet is oversaturated with blogs, but at the same time, it is a lot about finding the right angle. Maybe there's a niche area of law that is not yet really developed or really spoken about that you can kind of delve into and, and discuss and develop or maybe you can take a completely different angle and only focus on certain types of issues in a particular area of a very general uh, general law practice that might be blogged about um, from, a, from a totally different degree. I would say definitely write about something you're interested in. You don't want it to seem like homework or chore. It has to be something that you are excited about. No one really wants to read a mundane blog post. Um, you need to make it sound pretty exciting. Um, is a niche topic the only option? I don't think it is, but I think you also need to be smart about developing a topic. There might be tons of blogs on a particular area of law, and whether it's worth spending the time and energy on a very general idea or general topic, um, it might not be worth it in the end if it's not going to drive in traffic or it's not going to um, bolster your reputation in terms of search engine results or, or what have you. Um, but there are also times where it can be too niche. Maybe no one at all will read it. Uh, I think it's a lot about a balancing effect and figuring out what works and what doesn't work, what makes sense. You'll have to certainly do a lot of research to figure out you know, what, what the um, internet sphere is, is missing out on. And then, of course, making the most of your time. That's probably one of the most important uh, factors to consider because as lawyers, we're so pressed for billable hours, and we need to figure out how can we turn hours devoted to non-billable work or marketing into revenue for your practice. I don't know about some of the listeners today, but I do come from a very small law firm, and there are about seven attorneys and each attorney is expected to bring in work um, and, and to market and, and to do their own uh, outside non-billable work in order to bring in clients. 
we don't have a marketing department. We don't have anyone that essentially will take care of bringing in new clients. So it's a lot about being able to balance both billable and non-billable time. And I think a blog is a really good way to be able to showcase as well as to be able to perform that. Some technical details to consider when you do start a blog. Um, you should learn about the different types of platforms that are available. I personally use WordPress. I've heard that Joomla is very good too, but it's not something that I thought about when I uh, started blogging. It's, um, I, I really do like WordPress. I think it's pretty easy. Um, maybe some of you will have a tech department that will handle this. I'm a one-man show or one-woman show, and I do everything myself, so I had to be pretty smart with my considerations. I would also really recommend picking a template that showcases your content and provides your blog with a modern look. No one wants to look at something that is on um, bright neon yellow background and blue text and or red text. I mean, you need to make sure that it's really pristine looking. It's important. It, it should be a professional showcase of who you are as a lawyer as well. Um, also consider that the blog must be readable on smartphones and tablets, especially as you know, people travel and more and more individuals are using these types of um, these types of phones and tablets in order to search things online. Not everyone's at a PC or a laptop. And don't skip privacy policies, terms and conditions, disclaimers, et cetera, all very important factors, especially as a lawyer. Definitely read up on those, figure out what works, what doesn't work. Um, and then also talk to your firm. Your firm may or may not be OK with a legal blog. Um, it just probably depends on who's in charge, and they might have particular restrictions. Um, my, I'm lucky where my firm is, is pretty open, and of course, it wants everything to be professional and doesn't want um, any content to look negatively upon clients or to um, expose too much confidential information. But it is also really ideal that you make sure that, that you check with your firm. On top of that, also check relevant ethics rules, ethics rules and regulations. It will, of course, depend on where you are admitted and practicing. Um, some jurisdictions might require that you put an address, uh, that you put attorney advertising. It kind of depends. Definitely check up on that. Some jurisdictions might not yet be uh, developed enough, but I think at this point in time, almost Probably every state has something to say about social, lawyer social media use or blog use. Really important consideration. And then, of course, consider future employment scenarios. How will this impact your blog? Will it impact your blog? Um, if you're considering working in-house at any point in time, that might be uh, especially relevant. Some in-house uh, companies might not want you publishing anything that speaks to the company's position, or they might not want anyone to think that the company agrees or disagrees with, with what you're publishing. So this is something to certainly consider as, as well. But on the positive side, it actually may be relevant and may be helpful if you're looking to switch to another firm. Um, again, it's just all these factors to, to really consider. Now some tips on maintaining a legal blog. Uh, you should certainly take it seriously. You don't want to end up haphazardly updating. It should be done pretty often. Once a week is certainly ideal. Um, not always easy. I can certainly speak from experience there. But once a month is definitely essential. Uh, if you're not updating once a month, I think it's very difficult to take the blog seriously. Uh, of course, you should test feedback on different types of posts. What works best for one blog might not work best for you, especially if you're working in um, a niche area. You might really need to tailor it to less legal and um, a bit more general. Some people don't want to read about statutes and um, you know, relevant regulations and, and just talk from more of your perspective. Uh, it might take months or even years to find your ideal blogging strategy. Mine has certainly changed in the last seven years. I was updating far too frequently um, when I first started out, partially due to my excitement and my desire to learn more. But now I've taken a bit of a back road. I update when I think it's most relevant, when there are pressing issues, when people are excited to hear about 
uh, my perspective on, on something that is particularly timely. And then other ideas, um, you know, you might want to think about interviews, step-by-step -step guides, a series. People seem to really love series as something I'm doing right now. Uh, most common questions or mistakes, et cetera. You might even want to consider guest bloggers. I've done that in the past. It has not been one of my better experiences, and I actually have pretty much foreclosed on that for the time being, but certainly something to consider. And then, of course, keep it professional. Don't be afraid to incorporate your personality. One of the things I really like to do is when I travel and I go to a wine region, I usually add some of my photos that I've taken from my trips, and I talk about the wines I've tasted, the grapes, a little bit more about the region, some of the rules there. Um, I think that that's pretty relevant, and it gives my readers a bit more personality than some of my more common um, legal-style blog writing. And um, of course, you should always invite your readers to connect with you. Again, it's a lot about consumers wanting to know more about the product, the company, the person. I think that this is a really great opportunity to be able to expand your network. Um, but one of the things I've definitely learned, a mailing list is an absolute must. I think I was actually publishing probably for a few weeks before I had this. And someone said, how can I sign up for your blog? And I was really taken aback because, once again, I never expected anyone to read it. And I said, oh, I guess I should have a mailing list. So I've had that. Um, I recommend MailChimp. That's been my, my favorite platform so far. And um, you should also pay attention to the numbers, you know, what drives traffic in, what doesn't. Turn comment, don't turn comments off. I think it's really important, especially if you're writing about something that's timely, that's pertinent to an industry or to a certain type of consumer. Um, but you should absolutely monitor them because at the end of the day, your name is on this, your firm's name is associated with it. Uh, something to really be, uh, you know, to really keep in mind. And advertise your, your upcoming events. I really like to post about where I'm speaking um, and get you know, potential followers to come to my events when I'm, when I'm in town and, and what have you, or to turn on my CLEs. And of course, be patient. Um, you know, it, it certainly won't be an overnight adventure. You'll learn a lot and have a really good experience doing so. And then these are some resources that I have found to be very helpful just in, in my experience over the last two years. Um, I would sincerely recommend that you take a look at them if you are considering starting a blog. Um, they're all very helpful. ABA Journal Blogs especially has some of the top blogs, legal blogs out there, so you'll get a feel for what, uh, what has done well, what has worked, and um, also Keeping in mind like the formatting as well will be helpful to you. And um, just a short disclaimer, um, you know, everything is provided for educational and informational purposes only. And of course, as I mentioned before, you should always check all relevant ethical rules and regulations before starting a blog. Okay, thank you, Lindsay, for that great information on blogging. That's wonderful. Um, we will now turn to our next panelist, Nicole Aboud, to talk to us about podcasting. Nicole Aboud is a millennial speaker, owner of Aboud Media, podcaster, attorney, and college professor. Through her podcast, The Gen Y Lawyer, Nicole chats with inspiring Gen Y attorneys who are finding great success in their legal careers and with former attorneys who have decided to pursue alternative non-legal careers to find happiness. Nicole hopes to inspire lawyers to shake off their fears of being unconventional and embrace their unique talents. Thank you for joining us today, Nicole. I am so happy to be here. Um, hopefully my screen is working. It's showing everything going well on this end. <laughs> but let's jump into this. We've got some time. And let me just say hello to all the Rainmakers who are here. Please throw your questions in the chat room. Let's make this conversational. But we are talking about podcasting and how you can use podcasting to build your brand and grow your law practice. And this is just a quick overview, overview but I want to leave time for Q&A. So let's move it along. What is a podcast? <laughs> what the heck is a podcast? Not a lot of people know what it is, but it is actually growing in popularity. So a podcast is actually a digital audio file made available on the internet for downloading. That is probably the most basic, simplest explanation of what a podcast is. Uh, the word comes from, um, it's a combination of the word pod from iPod and uh, cast from broadcast. So 
put together. It's just a recorded audio file that you can make available. And it's not just on a website, for example. Uh, you can actually find podcasts on uh, anywhere a podcast can play, like iTunes, uh, Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, Google Play, right? So there are a lot of podcast players that are emerging that will play this audio file that you're recording, okay? So we have some idea of what a podcast is. Let me actually tell you a little bit more about me and my experience with my podcast. So um, similar to Lindsay, I actually started uh, blogging about three, four years ago. I was running my own law practice, and I thought, you know what, blogging would be a great way to market myself, to basically do everything that Lindsay just said a blog, a blog will do for you. <laughs> so I started a blog, and about a year into it, I uh, started to get tired of writing. I was writing motions at work all day. I would get home. The last thing I wanted to do was write some more. <laughs> and this is not to say that blogging isn't great. It definitely is. But I just didn't want to do it anymore. So I started exploring what else was out there. Um, how else can I create content and share my knowledge and just do what I want to do without having to write? And I stumbled upon podcasting. This was back in around 2015. And I, uh, so when I discovered podcasting, I thought, oh, this is amazing. I can just talk and record myself <laughs> and do the same thing that a blog would do for me. This is great. So I started exploring podcasting, and I decided to launch my podcast called the Gen Y Lawyer Podcast. And um, I thought, you know what, I want to focus on issues that young lawyers are dealing with. This is what I want to talk about. I want to talk and interview other young lawyers who are creating careers that they love, uh, building practices, and I wanted to learn how they're doing it. And I just thought, you know what, I want to talk to them. I want to hear their stories and put it on this platform and elevate their stories. So the podcast was born, and um, that little icon on the right just shows that I actually won, uh, well, I won one position on the ABA's Top 100 Blogs. And I realized my podcast is not a blog, but I don't know how I got on there, and I don't care. I will take it. <laughs> it's a great honor, so I'm super glad to have my podcast on there. So, um, but that was after about two years of work, and we'll talk more about how that, that happened. But that's a little bit about me, my experience with podcasting. I am utterly obsessed with podcasts. I listen to them when I drive. Uh, it's all I think about. I just love them. So I'm super glad to talk to you ladies about them and how they can help you. So first, um, a few statistics. So what, wh why are people podcasting? Is it even popular? Why even spend the time on this when we have other ways to create content? So here are some stats for you guys. Uh, and these are from a few months ago, so it's not super up to date, but it's just a few months old. Um, so over 35 million people listen to podcasts weekly in 2016, and the sources are listed there. So that is a lot of people listening. Uh, podcast listening grew 23% between 2015 and 2016. It is projected to grow another 20 or so percent in the next year, in the upcoming years, because it's just gaining in so much popularity. Uh, four hours and 10 minutes is the average time spent listening to podcasts each week by a person. So podcast listeners will spend an average of four hours and 10 minutes weekly, uh, on an, and that's on an average of five different podcasts. So people are spending a lot of time listening to these things. And it'll become clear why once we talk about the reasons why you should start one. But just a little hint, people spend a lot of time in their cars or commuting. So guess what they're doing? They're listening to podcasts. <laughs> All right, so podcasts, very important, and they're only going to become even more important and more popular going forward. So why should you start one, right? There are a lot of different reasons, aside from just the stats that I just listed. Uh, maybe you're interested in this platform. So this actually can apply both. Maybe you are interested in having your own or speaking up, and maybe you don't want to write anymore. You want to explore this new platform. But also think maybe the person you're trying to reach with your information, your ideal client, Maybe they're interested in this platform. Perhaps they're listening to podcasts, right? Chances are they are. Uh, another reason, convenience of consumption. So like I said, people are driving. They are riding the bus. They are walking. They're hiking. They're doing the dishes. Can they read while they're doing all that stuff? Probably not. I mean, maybe if you're on a bus. <laughs> but guess what they can do? They can listen. And that's what they're doing, right? So having a podcast will, or listening to a podcast, you can do that while you're doing anything else for the most part. So it's convenient to consume the information that lawyers are creating on podcasts. Uh, third reason, this is the one I talked about, avoid writing. Um, I mean, there's no shame in this. It's okay. We write all day. I totally understand if we're tired and don't want to write some more. <laughs> and you know what? Sometimes you can express yourself better 
through audio. Uh, I, even though I thought I was a fairly decent writer, I'm a much better speaker. So I prefer uh, to record my voice, like we're doing right now. I just come alive when I'm talking. So if you're that type of person and you think you're more effective uh, speaking, then a podcast is for you. And last but not least, it is fun. Ladies, it is so fun to record a podcast and just to have a podcast and to share your message with the world, right? It's really fun. Uh, like Lindsay said, it's not a, it, it shouldn't be a chore, and hopefully podcasting isn't either for you. So it's definitely a fun time. <laughs> All right, so aside from why you should start one, let's talk about how it can actually help you build your practice. And I'm going to alternate. Let me check the chat room real quick, make sure everything is still good. Okay, hopefully everything's still good. I'm sure someone will let me know if it's not. But podcasting and building your practice, how can, we, how can podcasting do this for you? So first one, podcasting is actually very personal and very intimate. So when, when your listeners, your ideal client, are, is listening to your podcast, you're essentially whispering in their ear, right? You are talking right into their ear. It's just you and them. It's just your voice that, you're, that they're listening to. So it's very intimate, right? It's an intimate relationship that you start building with the people who are listening to your podcast. Along the same lines, you get to build a relationship with your audience. So right now, you guys don't see me, but you hear my voice. And you can kind of get a sense of my personality. You can get maybe get a sense of my enthusiasm and my energy. And that's exactly what happens. And podcasting will allow you to bring your, your words to life because you're speaking them. And when people can hear you, they can hear your personality. They can start building that trust that needs to be there before someone can hire an attorney. And it's not, and it's very difficult to fake your personality on a podcast because it just comes through all the time and it's in your voice. It's very difficult to fake that. So people will start building a relationship with the podcasters that they listen to. Um, so you can see how powerful that is when um, a potential client starts listening to your podcast and hearing you talk about the law or whatever it is that you decide to start your podcast about, they will start to trust you before they even meet you. And you can see how, uh, how far that goes in helping you bring in clients and bring in business, right? Because you don't have to build that relationship uh, or you don't have to work as hard to build a relationship in person when people already come to you feeling like they, knew you, they know you already from listening to your voice. Third way it's going to help you build your practice. It's actually, gonna, it's actually gonna help you practice your public speaking skills, uh, your, your deposition taking skills. It's gonna help you with your oral skills. It just, it can't not, right? Because you're speaking all the time. So you become a very um, good speaker, but also your listening skills enhance, and that goes a long way in becoming a better lawyer, right? Because sure, we can talk, but can we listen? <laughs> and that's the good sign of a good lawyer. And this will help you do that. It's going to expand your network of influence and influencers. So uh, through my podcast, I am uh, very lucky and very blessed to have been able to meet some amazing lawyers. Uh, because I feature lawyers on my podcast, I reach out to them, asking them to be my guests, right? And up until this day, I have maybe out of hundreds of people I've reached out to, I've had maybe two say they couldn't make it because they were busy. But all the others who were able to come on to my uh, podcast, I've been able to spend time with them and get to know them for an hour. I mean, can you imagine being able to network and get to know someone on such a deep level and do that with multiple people, right? And this is assuming you have guests on your show. Uh, but regardless, if you have a podcast, you automatically become the go-to person uh, in that space that you're talking about. So if you're talking about family law, you will become the go-to person and you will get to know other family law attorneys and other people who are in positions of influence as well. And the fact that you have a podcast, it, it makes it a little bit easier to reach out to people just saying, hey, you want to be on my podcast? <laughs> and it kind of breaks that ice. Um, it makes it easier to reach people that you never thought you'd be able to reach. Uh, and like going back to what I was saying, I, in the, when I started my podcast, I was terrified of reaching out to lawyers who I thought were big time lawyers and I didn't know what to say. But I used my podcast. I said, you know what, I have this new podcast. I, uh, I, I, it's essentially speaking to young lawyers. That's who my audience members are. So I'd love to have you on to share your career story, your journey. And they were more than happy to do it because, as we all know, the running joke goes, lawyers love to talk. So trust me when I say they will want to be on your podcast. And, and that goes for guests in general, right? So you can expand your network. Another reason or another way a podcast can actually help you, let me just check, um, 
hopefully, okay, hopefully you guys can still hear me. I'm just checking up on the chat room. Okay, I'll just keep checking. Let me know if something's wrong. Uh, so another way a podcast, having a podcast can help build your brand and build your practice is actually it's going to help you establish your thought leadership. So the, similar to a, uh, to a blog, if you are constantly writing about or speaking about a certain subject, you are inevitably going to become known as that go-to person, as that expert, as that thought leader in that space. So similar to how Lindsay is now, um, she's known for her wine blog, and that's, and I'm sure when other lawyers think of um, when they need a wine lawyer, they're going to think of her. Or when clients think they need help with anything, they're going to think of her. So same thing with the podcast. If you are always talking about something, that's what you will become known for. So um, there are many lawyers, and I'll give you guys um, some examples at the end, but there are many lawyers who have started podcasts that relate to their practice area. So a friend of mine, he actually has a franchise uh, podcast where he talks about franchising, uh, both on from the franchisor, franchisee end of things, and he actually brings in a lot of business through his podcast because now his name has become so associated with franchising uh, and franchise law that people automatically think of him when they think that they need some help in that area. Another reason or another way a podcast can actually help you build your practice is that it helps you help others. Uh, so here's what I mean by that. Uh, there's this really famous Zig Ziglar quote that says, you can have everything you want in life if you just help enough other, other people get what they want. And I wholeheartedly believe in it. So what that means is if you are able through your podcast to give other people a platform to share their message, to um, share their story, to educate your listeners, then by helping them, you are helping yourself. Because you will be known as that helpful person. And I think back to any time you've ever needed help from anyone. If you think about it, the only time people will help you is if you've helped them first. It's, I don't know, it shouldn't be like that, but it is. That's just human nature. So if you're able to help others and give them a platform, they will, they will, do, they will help you back in return, right? So keep that in mind as well. Po uh, another way, one of the final ways that having a podcast can actually help you, help you build your practice is um, by, well, actually, this is if you don't want to necessarily start a podcast of your own, is if you want to be a guest on a podcast, right? So maybe you're not fully ready to jump into starting your own podcast. You actually can dip your toes in the water by being a guest on other lawyer podcast shows or just other podcasts, right? So reach out and get a feel for what it's like. And you'll see that by being a guest on a podcast, not necessarily just the host, you also will bring attention to yourself and your practice, you will start building your brand, you will gain attention, especially if you're helpful, right? If you're bringing value, if you're sharing valuable information while you're uh, a guest on someone else's show, okay? So those are some of the reasons that building, that ha having a podcast will help you build your practice. Uh, just quickly to share a quick personal note, and let me make sure I have some time, I do. Um, through my podcast, it has actually brought me many, many opportunities. Uh, my podcast, as you've noticed, doesn't, focus on a practice area, right, because that's not what I wanted it to focus on. But through my podcast, I have actually been able to um, secure a lot of uh, speaking opportunities, which is what I wanted. Um, I've been able to meet some amazing people who have referred me to other opportunities, who have connected me with people I've wanted to connect with. And actually, my podcast helped, helped me ultimately leave my practice, so leave the practice of law and open my business and launch my business. But that's a story for a different day. But having a podcast can truly do all this for you because it did it for me. Okay, so how are you going to structure your podcast? I'm just going to run through these a little bit and we can, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat room. So I know thinking about starting a podcast sounds like it's super technical. It might be very difficult, but believe me when I say if I can do it, anyone can. I know I'm a millennial, but believe it or not, I'm not super techie, <laughs> right, to give into some stereotypes over here. So I Googled this stuff. I looked it up. I did not have anyone else helping me. I just looked it up. And if I was able to put it together, luckily I found a lot of free information online. Um, I was able to put it together, so you can too. Okay? So let's put that aside. Don't let that fear stop you from stop starting a podcast. But once you get past the technical stuff and you set that fear aside, how are you actually going to get this podcast together up and running? So for me, it actually took me about – a month and a half, maybe two months to actually think about what I wanted to talk about and structure it. Uh, you don't have to take that long, but for me, it just took me a while to do it. 
And the first thing I would say is think about what it is you want to talk about. Again, keep in mind that what you talk about is what you will become known for. So if you're using this podcast to build your practice, um, maybe you want it to relate to your, law, your practice area. Uh, if you just want to make it more general and build your brand, right, uh, you can make it more of a general thing. And I'm actually going to check the chat room, make sure. Okay, good. So we have some questions. That's super exciting. I'm going to leave room. So let me just um, hustle a little bit. Think of the format. So think of what you want to talk about. In terms of format, there are many different ways you can structure your podcast. So you can make it a Q&A uh, interview style. That's how I do mine, where I bring on guests, I ask them questions, they answer. Um, so you can have it that way. You can be solo. So it can just be you speaking into the microphone and just educating, informing, entertaining, whatever you want to do. You can have a co-host. You can make it more of a storytelling kind of thing, right? You can format it however you want, ladies, because this is your podcast, and no one can tell you what you can do with it. <laughs> it's all you. That's the best part. Uh, production. Do you want this to be? Do you want your episodes to be highly produced, or do you want them to be more simple, more raw, authentic? Either one is fine. Again, um, no rules, just whatever you want it to be. Of course, there are some guidelines, which we can talk about at a different time, but. The point is you can make it however you want it. Frequency. So Lindsay touched upon when she started blogging, she was doing it re pretty often, and then she, she realized that maybe once a week was better. Uh, same thing with podcasting. You need to do it pretty frequently, right? Um, but no matter what you choose, if you decide to go weekly, biweekly, monthly, um, you just need to be consistent. That is the most important thing that applies for any kind of content creation you're going to do, anything you do in life, actually. This is a little nugget of wisdom. Uh, be consistent. <laughs> because if you publish one and then disappear and then come back three months later, that's not going to work. It's not going to be effective. You're going to get upset and you're going to think it's not working. Consistency is the key. Because uh, let me tell you, for mine, I publish an episode every single Monday. I've done it for the past two years. And it took about nine months before anyone even started um, really recognizing the podcast. So sure, there were listeners in the beginning. Uh, luckily, I have a big family. My family was listening. It made me feel good. It made me feel like people were listening. <laughs> um, but it took, it took a long time before it really started catching on. And you need to go into this with that mindset. Finally, topic, subject matter. What do you want to talk about? Do you want to niche it down? Do you want to keep it broad? Do you want it to be about family law? Do you want it to be about child custody specifically? Do you want to make it broader and just talk about women in the law? Right? It can be anything you want, but you need to decide. And you can always pivot later on. All right, I'm going to move it along, you guys, because I really want to answer questions, and I'm sure Lindsay does too. What do you really need to get started, aside from all the technical, um, like a microphone and stuff like that? We'll get to that. Very first thing you need is guts. Ladies, you need, you need some guts to start this podcast, or really anything in life. And I know you've got it. So you need the guts. You have the courage to put your voice, to record your voice, and share your message, right? You have the courage to change people's lives, because that's exactly what you'll do with your podcast. Dedication, same, like I was saying, consistency is key. So can you dedicate the time needed um, every week, every month, whenever it is you want to do it? Can you dedicate time, right? Because it's going to take it. It's going to need it. Do you have, um, or what else you'll need is a message, right? So what's your angle? What's your unique selling proposition? What is going to make you, assuming there are two different family law uh, podcasts that exist out there, what's going to make yours different? Right? What's your message? Um, aside from what's going to make you different, different, what's going to help people connect with you? Because you're a real person at the end of the day. So share your message, and you will attract the right type of client and the right type of listener. Finally, equipment. Very, very last one. Um, it doesn't have to be super com complicated. The most important thing you need is a microphone. Um, and of course, uh, we can reach out to me, and I'll give you guys a list of what exactly you need. You need a microphone. You need some recording software, and there are free ones out there if you're going to record on your computer, if you're going to record through the internet. Uh, and then you need a media host, which means that's where you're actually going to upload your file. That's where you're going to store your file. Uh, and, and then you need some editing software as well. Again, we can talk about this. If you can't do it yourself, don't worry. There are people out there who can help you. Don't let it stop you. OK, let me just move on. Um, helpful resources. I actually have a Facebook group for lady lawyers who podcast, and we want you in there. If you are thinking about starting a podcast, please join us in that group. Um, we have a good group of women who are either thinking about starting a podcast or already have a podcast. They're all, they're all uh, female lawyers as well, so you'll be in good company. Uh, please search that and join it. 
And then I listed a few other resources for you ladies if you're interested in um, actually doing this. So I, I, these are some podcasts that I listen to. So podcasts that are about podcasting, if you actually want to learn about it. She Podcast is hosted by women. It's for women podcasters. The School of Podcasting and the Audacity to Podcast are all really good resources to start learning more about podcasting. Other podcasts, um, if you want to look at some examples of how other lawyers are using podcasts to build their practices, I uh, recommend Franchise Euphoria. That's the one I mentioned earlier. Student Loan Show. So this guy talks about student loan law. Uh, JD Blogger. It's um, hosted by John Skiba, and he does such a good job, uh, and he brings in clients through his podcast as well. So he's a good resource to look at. All right, I want to leave um, time for questions, and let me see if I can change presenters or... Carol, if you want to jump in here, but maybe we can look at some questions. Yeah, Nicole, if you can keep flipping the slides, I'll, I'll sure. talk. Um, and thank you, Nicole, so much for giving us such great ideas about podcasting and all that wonderful information. Um, we now have a few minutes to take questions from both of our panelists, and we have a bunch. So I'm going to read them off. Um, if I don't get to yours, you can uh, contact um, Lindsay or Nicole with the uh, contact information we provided and as a reminder the slides will be emailed to to all of you and it has their information which is also on the screen um, so uh, Nicole I think this one is for you uh, okay. when you started out when you started out how did you drive traffic to your podcast in a sea of podcasts did you repost on social media or ask friends what did you do Oh yeah, I did it all. I went, yeah, I posted all over my social media. I personally reached out to friends who I thought would be interested. Um, though I didn't spend money. I really haven't spent much money on marketing. So it was really just word of mouth, tell, told my friends, got the word out, uh, and social media played a big role. Great, great. And um, here, Lindsay has a question going back to you. Someone said they had started a blog and they had a few um, stops and starts and you know, they're not certain about how to separate personal and professional and, and find a, a good topic. So what are your suggestions there? Um, so from my experience, I, I tend not to write too much personal information on my blog because it really, I, I really am using it for professional reasons. Um, I think I've found a good balance where when I do talk about anything personal, it's either presentations I'm giving talks, seminars, um, books, or, or what have you, or it's a trip I made to a wine region. I mean, that I think kind of personalizes it a bit more. I think another way to kind of make it a bit more personal is to bring in your personality uh, as much as you can to some of these topics. Maybe you're completely against something that an agency is doing, completely against a proposed rule, um, or a proposed bill, I think that that's a really great way to not only showcase your smarts, but also your personality. I would be really careful with posting too much personal information, but I think maybe that's also just my, my preferences. Um, and in terms of finding good measured topics, I, I would start with finding things that are current. Um, I think maybe one idea would be to look at Google News um, if you search or Google Alerts, um, you can search for particular topics. So for example, I get, um, every day I get uh, TalkWalker and Google Alerts for various keywords relating to wine law. And I look through them, I see what links are relevant, I look at some of them, and I decide, does this make sense for me to blog about? Is it worth my time? Will it drive in traffic? Is it worth it for my readers to learn about you know, something new? And that's actually something I just did the other day. Um, I was looking at an article that came up on one of my Google Alerts and um, it related to Texas and how Texas is actually, there's a proposed bill in their house uh, relating to wine and Appalachians of origin. And I was like, okay, this is really interesting, it's relevant, and I decided to write a blog entry on it. And the other thing that you might want to consider, especially when you're just starting out, um, you know, at this point you're probably, you've been working as a lawyer for a few years or, or maybe even longer than that, and you know what type of questions potential clients ask or that come up in, in your field. And um, you might want to consider you know, just doing a Q&A there. Um, that might be something to think about as well. Great, great. We have another question for Nicole. Um, someone's asking, what's the difference between a podcast and videos that you might post on YouTube? Oh yeah, good question. So, um, and you can have video podcasts, by the way. So it is just a different platform. 
a video, you're seeing some visual. I'm assuming you mean an actual video. It's not just the podcast being placed on YouTube. Uh, on YouTube, you're going to have videos, so it's audio, it, you're going to actually see something. With podcasting, it's mostly just listening. Um, so you can do it, like I said, on the go. So one is just, just audio, and the other one is audio and visual. Great. And, <laughs> Very simple and, answer. <laughs> no, it's a great, a great answer. And someone else asked, um, how long are they generally? Ooh, how so long that's, are the podcasts? That is going to vary. That is up to you and how long your listeners are willing to listen. Um, but they can vary. Some are 10 minutes, some are 20, mine are usually 30. Uh, they can go up to an hour. I've heard of podcasts lasting three hours. Um, there, I've heard there's no such thing as too long, just too boring. So I wouldn't worry about how long. <laughs> Don't worry about how long it is. Um, but test it out. Start off with 20 and test it out. Great. I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to go back to Nicole. And I'm getting a couple of questions about um, what points to focus on on the blogs. Um, do you target to clients? Do you write in legal terms? Um, how do you find, you know, how do you identify your audience and how specific? For the, was this, sorry, was this for me or was this for Lindsay? No, that's for you. For the podcast, okay. So along with. Oh, no, blog, I'm sorry. Yes, for, for, sorry, Nicole, for Lindsay, okay. but I guess you can both address it. It applies to both. No, take it, Lindsay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry. I thought it was for Nicole. Can you just, do you mind repeating it? Sure. I, I'm getting a bunch of questions about how to specify, uh, how to find a topic, how to identify your target audience, whether to talk in legal or more general terms. Yeah. Um, so for me, I think it's been trial and error because um, that a lot of that has changed for me. Um, I was certainly, I, I think, a lot more strict with my writing in the beginning, a lot more legal. And I've learned that people were not always interested in that. Um, it depends, I think, again, on your audience. My audience, I think, tends to be mostly industry professionals or industry members um, that that somehow get onto the blog. I mean, of course, they do have lawyers that are just naturally curious about the topic or interested in, in getting into the theory of practice. Um, but I, for me personally, I mean, I use it as a marketing generation tool, so I try to keep it a little bit more general. Um, and then in terms of just finding topics, um, you know, I, I think sometimes what I also like to do is I look to see, you know, what's coming up, what people are searching for in Google uh, search results. And it might be skewed a bit because maybe I'm searching for wine law or wine law topics all the time, but I kind of get a feel for like the popular topics by start typing into the search engine some key topics and, and I see like what, what's coming up as, as more popular results. And sometimes I just get inspiration from that. Great. Great. Well, thank you both, Lindsay and Nicole, for a wonderful presentation. Again, if we didn't have time to answer questions, you can reach out to either of the panelists with the contact information that was um, provided. And we at Women Rainmakers have many exciting events that are just around the corner. Our next Wednesday Rainmaking um, by the Women Rainmakers of the Law Practice Division webinar series will be on September 20th, and the topic is hosting signature events that impact your bottom line. Then on November 29th, we'll have a webinar on updating your LinkedIn profile. Please also look for information on our local programming, which will take place during the week of September 11, 2017 in a city near you. Um, the topic for that will be niche marketing, how to identify and target your ideal clients. Please contact me if you have ideas for future webinars that you would like us to consider or if you would like to give us feedback. You will be sent an evaluation survey at the end of this call. We thank you in advance for taking the time to complete it. Your ideas and feedback are very important to us. And it looks like that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Lauren, for your assistance. And thank you, Lindsay and Nicole, for your thoughtful presentation. Until we meet, a, until we meet you again on our next Wednesday Rainmaking webinar by the Women Rainmakers on September 20th on hosting signature events, we wish you well on your successful rainmaking. Thank you.